É, com imensa satisfação que nós vamos dar início a essa série de reuniões acadêmicas, científicas, usando esse modelo, esse formato de webinar, que usamos muito já ao longo do último ano, é, em função da pandemia, e dessa vez para tratar de um tema que é bastante importante, muito caro a todos nós, que é justamente as questões socioambientais vinculadas especialmente às águas transfronteiriças. Nós vamos ter aí uma sequência de seminários, uma a cada mês, praticamente, discutindo como essas questões eh, se apresentam em diversas localidades do mundo. E hoje nós teremos a honra e o prazer de receber o professor Ken Conca, eh, que vai abrir o nosso seminário, é um prazer, uma honra contar com a presença dele aqui entre nós, e essa sessão será coordenada pelo professor Luiz Paulo Silva, que também é geógrafo da Federal da Bahia. Então, antes de passar, eu queria rapidamente cumprimentar o professor Ken Conca. Thank you for accepting our invitation, professor. I'm sure that your presentation will contribute to our reflections on social and environment actions, in particular in climate change and transborder water. Uh, I would like so, to our team to uh, especially for support uh, the organization of this meeting. And now I pass the word to Professor Luis Paulo, who will coordinate this, this section. Please, Luis, is you. Hello, hello. Uh, Ken, can you hear me now? Um, okay. Uh, um, oh, maybe we have, I have some some malicious here. Um, uh, we are going to reconnect uh, uh, Ken. Can you hear us? Not yet. No. Uh, Professor Cam? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm doing just a short presentation. Uh, maybe it can while Ken is uh, reconnecting, I can introduce him, maybe. Uh, Isabella, you can talk with him on backstage to see it sort the... Yeah. Uh, while uh, Ken is uh, reconnecting, maybe to, to see what's going on with audio and video. Uh, we have some issues with his audio and video. Um, well. Many thanks for everybody to be here with us in our first uh, first webinar uh, regarding transmodern waters around the globe. Uh, I'm Luis Paulo Batista da Silva, uh, assistant professor here in Federal University of Bahia. Um, uh, Ken? Hi, can, can you hear me? Hi. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yes. I'm good now with the audio. Apologies, I had to reconnect. <laughs> no problem. And many thanks. Uh, Ken, I'm just uh, I'm, then I'm going to introduce you and then pass your uh, the floor to our talk. Um, but first of all, um, let me do some acknowledge acknowledgement about uh, because yeah, to in order to see people institutions that help us with our our research. Uh, first of all, first of all, in Portuguese, uh, I would like eu gostaria de agradecer. Uh, Bem, as, as nossas instituições que dão suporte às nossas pesquisas, o Programa de Pós-Graduação em Geografia da UFBA, o Programa de Pós-Graduação em Geografia Humana da Universidade de São Paulo, é, o Instituto de Estudos Avançados da USP também, é, e também instituições que dão suporte para, nossa, para nossas pesquisas, principalmente o CNPq e a FAPESP. É, e também é, fazer uma apresentação do professor Ken em português e depois eu faço em inglês. Uh, professor Ken é professor de Relações Internacionais na School of International Services da American University, em Washington. Antes de ingressar no corpo da instituição, em 2010, ele passou 17 anos trabalhando no Departamento de Governo e Política da Universidade de Maryland. Suas pesquisas enfocam a governança ambiental, global, construção da paz ambiental em sociedades é, marcadas pela guerra, Política Ambiental e Política no Sistema das Nações Unidas, Governança da Água e Análise de Política Ambiental. Uh, and then in English, let me do some acknowledgements for everybody that uh, institutions that help us here doing our research. 
First of all, the, our institutions, the program of post-graduation in, in Federal University of Bahia, uh, the program of post-graduation in Human Geography in USP, São Paulo, the Institute of Advanced Studies in USP, FAPESP, and CNPq, CNPq, our research grant institutions. And then uh, let me introduce Professor Ken Conca, he is a professor of international relations in the School of International Service at American University. Uh, which research focuses on the environment, conflict, and visibility, water politics and governance, and the whole of the United Nations in environmental governance. Dr. Conca's work has been recognized in several major awards for, I think, mainly for his 2005 book, Governing Water, Contentious Transnational Politics and Global Institutions Building. Uh, he's also a member of the UN Environment, uh, Environment Programs Expert Advisory Group on Conflict and Peace Building, and he served previously on the Scientific Steering Committee on Global Environmental Change and Human Security for International Human Dimensions. Uh, his most recent books are Unfinished, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Unfinished Foundation, The United Nations and Global Environmental Governance from 2015, and the Oxford Handbook of Water Politics and Policy from 2018. And Dr. Conca earned his PhD from the Energy and Resources, Resources Group at the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, Professor Conca, the, the floor is yours for a presentation uh, 30 to 40 minutes, and then we have a session of Q&A. Many thanks, and uh, let's enjoy. <laughs> Thank you, Luis Paulo. You're seeing my slides, I assume? Um, uh, one second, they are setting. It's loaded, mm -hmm. so you can bring it up when you get a chance. Uh, yeah. There we go. Very good. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, uh, I will present in English, mas brevemente em português. Eu tenho que pedir desculpas todo mundo, porque eu falo português um pouco. E Luiz Paulo me pediu apresentar em português, mas... Eu não tenho confiança com esta matéria, especialmente neste modo virtual, mas quando visitar no Brasil, pela próxima vez, vamos falar em português. Ok, so apologies for uh, presenting in English in this forum, but um, my limitations with the Portuguese language uh, made it necessary. Thank you so much for the invitation, Luis Paulo, Professor Wagner, the technical team. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, presenting some ideas that I hope will uh, set a good tone for the entire series. So I'd like to start by talking a little bit about what I'm going to present, just an overview of the presentation. Uh, I'm going to talk some about what I think it is that we know, or perhaps I should say what we think we know about uh, water, climate change, conflict risk uh, in transboundary basins, uh, particularly international basins, although other forms of transboundary basins certainly apply to this as well. Um, and what I think the conventional wisdom or the broad understanding in that literature is and the sorts of policy prescriptions that we're starting to see come from uh, that literature. Um, I don't disagree with what I'm going to present, but I think it's quite limited and quite incomplete. And so I'm going to spend some time talking about some under-examined forms of conflict risk um, and some ways in which the standard policy prescriptions may prove to be uh, inadequate. And at the end, I'll say just a very little bit about what I think the implications uh, of that are and some directions in which we need to proceed. So there are an estimated 310 uh, river basins in the world that either form borders between countries or cross borders uh, between countries or do both, as many of them do. Uh, if I had pre been presenting this work to you 20 years ago, that number would have been 263 uh, because that was the best estimate at that time. But as the geographic information systems have improved uh, and as the political map of the world has changed, uh, that number uh, has increased. Um, almost every country in the world shares uh, an important river with one or more of its neighbors. 
uh, in some cases that creates very extreme forms of dependency. To take just one example, Mozambique uh, shares seven uh, river basins and is downstream on all of them, which is a challenging position uh, to be in. Our attention is drawn to the large multilateral basins, the Danube, the Nile, uh, the Mekong, the Amazon, uh, and, and, and so on. Many of those 310 uh, basins uh, link only two countries, and sometimes they do so in very asymmetrical upstream-downstream uh, relationships. Uh, concerns about conflict related to or along those rivers uh, are, are not new at all. This is from a database, a water conflict chronology that was assembled by uh, the Pacific Institute. Some of you may be familiar with the work of Peter Glick, the founder of the Pacific Institute. And some of the oldest episodes that are listed um, in, in this uh, are transboundary river related. Um, I find uh, this one in 1503 particularly interested, uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, and Machiavelli planning to divert the river in a conflict between the Italian city-states of Pisa and Florence. I would have loved to be an observer in that conversation when they were planning that. Um, that has led uh, many people in, in, in today's times uh, to think that particularly in the context of climate change, um, conflict risk is quite serious. Uh, sometimes this gets presented in, 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 in quite an extreme and a hyperbolic manner. Uh, this is a quote uh, from Ban Ki-moon, who was not the sort of secretary general who would normally speak in those overwrought and hyperbolic tones, but um, uh, due to lack of water lead to conflict, population growth, many conflicts just over the horizon. Here he is warning the UN Security Council 10 years ago that uh, this dangerous cocktail of, of, of conditions was creating an unholy brew, that's a strong phrase, that can create dangerous security vacuums and that mega crises may be the new normal. Um, the Center for International and Strategic Studies, which is a sort of, uh, I guess I would call it a center-right uh, center to right uh, think tank here in Washington, uh, talking about the role of water in the Middle East, uh, the Syria conference, the, the Syria conflict. Uh, even in the world of fiction, some of you may be familiar with this book by Paolo Basigalupi, The Water Knife, which uh, it's a dystopian vision of a, of a, a near future southwestern United States in which some states are water rich and some states are water poor and essentially the states have militarized their borders um, the water rich states to keep water refugees out and the water poor states to keep water refugees uh, in. If you do a Google Scholar search on the phrase water wars uh, you get quite a lot of this sort of uh, uh, quite a lot of this uh, sort of material. Um, often, this is presented as simply a question of water scarcity, uh, water availability. So, this is a graphic from the World Resources Institute that shows uh, river basins in the world that are particularly stressed and strained um, around water availability. Simply a calculation of estimated volume of water flow. Uh, per capita, uh, per person in the basin. I don't think that's a particularly good way to look at uh, questions of tension or conflict risk, uh, as will become clear uh, in just a moment. Um, well, we have a lot of research on this question, and I do think there are some things that we've learned from that research to get us started. First, we know that water cooperation is much more common than water conflict. There was a famous study done by um, Shira Yaffe and Aaron Wolf and some other people around the geography program at Oregon State University in the United States uh, back in the early 2000s that looked at 50 years of events data in um, a large proportion of those two, 263 international river basins. They identified almost 2,000 episodes of conflict or cooperation that they plotted on a scale based on their intensity. Um, and they found that uh, two-thirds of the events were cooperative, that of the conflict issues, uh, episodes, 
Very few of them rose to the level of being militarized disputes or involving actual violence. Um, only 37 episodes rose to that level. Uh, most of those were in the Middle East and in particular around Israel and its neighbors in the context of the Jordan, uh, a very contested uh, river basin uh, in a very tough neighborhood. Um, and that, But interestingly, what they found that when conflict arose didn't correlate with water availability, didn't correlate with income levels in the basin, didn't correlate with type of governing regime in the basin. And what they found was not a structural model like that, where you would look at the factors that are, exist in the basin and then try to forecast conflict based on that. What they found instead was more of a dynamic model, what I would call a stress and response model. When surprising changes occurred in the basin, uh, when they occur, occurred rapidly, and when they occurred in the absence of effective governing institutions that could dialogue about them, that was when conflict risk uh, was the greatest. So in the particular case of newly internationalized basins, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the former Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia splintering, and, and, and Ethiopia and Eritrea, and so on, those are risky moments. Um, largely because the lack of any kind of institutionalized dialogue around managing water supplies or allocating water supplies. Uh, but more generally, a country upstream decides to build a dam or a large flood control project or an irrigation scheme, an agricultural colonization scheme, um, and that creates consequences for, uh, for, for its neighbors. Um, this is an attempt using that sort of a model and that sort of a logic to identify basins at risk in the world. I know the font is very small, don't worry, if you can, I don't expect you, I'm not going to use this slide. But just to make the point, these were 20 basins that they identified as basins at risk. But the key point here is to identify basins at risk, they're simply looking at basins in which significant infrastructure projects are being developed and there's the absence of some sort of a treaty regime to facilitate dialogue among the riparian countries, among the countries that, 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 that share the basin. Um, I think that's interesting and important to, to look at. I also think it's a limited model for understanding uh, basin dynamics and institutional dynamics, as I'll say in just a moment. But given that that is where the research has historically pointed us, I think the formula for cooperation that has come out of this is something like what I have on the screen now, um, a sort of a three-step recipe for managing conflict risk. First, try to avoid surprises. So we see lots of emphasis on the exchange of information, on prior notification, uh, joint monitoring of conditions uh, within the basin, cons frequent consultation. Second, creating the capacity uh, for adaptive management, um, seeing problems that are coming, adjusting to them in a flexible manner. Often adaptive management is rendered in a somewhat technocratic fashion. Technical monitoring, joint monitoring, project planning, impact assessment. Um, and while I think that's important, as I'll say in a moment, I think there's a political dimension to adaptive management that this formula um, doesn't sufficiently emphasize. Um, and then third, increase the capacity for dialogue uh, and, 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 and for dispute resolution. And often the recipe there will be to create some sort of a multilateral basin commission that represents all the countries in the basin and, and perhaps other relevant entities, a regional development authority or something like that, um, perhaps include me specific mechanisms for arbitration or other means, third-party consultations, other means of resolving uh, disputes that can't simply be resolved through negotiations, right? Um, well, what about climate change? When we add climate change to the mix, uh, uh, I think the conventional wisdom is that it simply intensifies the, that problem of conflict risk, that stress and response problem, um, and that it intensifies the need for those policy uh, responses. I won't, in the interest of time, I, I assume people are relatively familiar with this. I'll skip over it. We're waiting for IPCC's assessment report six. In fact, there's a meeting today on the water chapter about that assessment report, and we all look forward to seeing what it has to say. Um, I think the water impacts of climate change are reasonably well known. 
um, and I think this list will be familiar to people, um, and the large conclusion of the last assessment report, somewhat dated now, freshwater related risks of climate change increase significantly. Um, so that too, much like the water wars narrative, has led to a fairly crude uh, climate wars narrative. Um, I just did a Google search on books that have the phrase climate wars uh, in the title. Um, and, 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 and there are several of them. And there are more sophisticated treatments of this. There's some kind of popular, uh, the climate wars is popular f frame for the media. Um, an interesting example, though, is Lake Chad. If we look at how the problem in Lake Chad is frequently characterized, right? Drying Lake Chad Basin. Uh, the disappearing, the vanishing lake, and so on. And there's this sense that, driven by climate change and some other factors, uh, the lake is shrinking. That creates scarcity, and that scarcity triggers tensions. I'm not saying that analysis is wrong, but I think it's quite incomplete. If you actually look at Lake Chad in the basin, you see that most of the shrinkage in the lake occurred in the 1970s and the 1980s. Uh, and so if we're seeing recent tensions being triggered, they're probably not being triggered by that with a 30-year lag time. So we need to think in a little bit different manner. And in fact, if you look at water storage in Lake Chad over the last two decades, it's actually increasing. The problem is the instability, the uncertainty, uh, the variability, um, both for smallholders and herders and people with local livelihoods they're well aware of how to adapt to a drought season they've lived with we could learn a lot from them about how to adapt with drought because they've lived through it for, for centuries um, the problem is when the pattern of wet years and dry years in the entire cycle has become destabilized and the unpredictability uh, increases so a smallholder you know may own some goats as a, as a, as a, essentially as a bank account, as a way to protect themselves. Um, and they don't know whether to sell the goats or slaughter the goats or whether it will rain. And so the whole system has become destabilized and the problem of risk management uh, and the way that actors adapt to risk and the decisions they make in the context of this sort of high risk and high uncertainty, that's a big piece of the conflict risk that we need to, that we need to think about and talk about. But if we go back to even allowing for that, if we go back to that stress and response model of, of water and conflict and risk, I think the perception is that climate change intensifies the problem both directly because the extreme events, the seasonal variability, the interannual fluctuations, that could be those rapid unpleasant surprises, right? The rapid stresses that the basin and the actors and the institutions can't adapt to. Um, and also climate change indirectly. Um, if, if basin states, you know, as they manage risk, if they start implementing unilateral strategies, building dams, storing more water, disrupting flows in various sorts of ways, that unilateral rapid action could also become the stress in that stress and response model of conflict. Well, I guess my response to that picture that I just drew for you would be to say I don't disagree with it, um, but I think it misses a few important elements. And so my answer is yes, but. And that but, that however, contains three elements. And so I'll just sketch these very, very briefly, and I'll, I'm going to leave plenty of time for us to have conversation and discuss. But just to show you where I'm going, I'll list the three elements. First, climate change is only one part of the story of managing risk and adapting to uncertainty. And whether we're talking about very, very small and localized and not particularly powerful actors, or whether we're talking about some very powerful and influential actors, governments, multinational corporations, the multilateral development banks, as they manage uncertainty and risk around water, they're thinking about a lot more than climate change. Um, and there are other forms of financial or political risk uh, that tend to dominate the kind of ad adaptations that we are seeing. And we have to understand that if we're going to think about conflict. Second, the problem is not simply the capacity of institutions to be more flexible, basin commissions and the like, treaty arrangements. Um, often they kind of handcuff the actors. They create 
This is what international law often tries to do. They create a hard and fast agreement that actors can then plan around uh, and that actors can, can comply with um, and, and, and disputes can be resolved because you have essentially a contract. And much of the argument is, well, that's inflexible. And in a world of uncertainty where we need flexible adaptation, we need to create more flexible, living, breathing institutions that, that, that can be more nimble and that can adapt. Well, the problem is, while it is true that many of the institutional arrangements we've created lack flexibility and adaptive capacity, they also have a real problem with scope and authority, and we need to bring that into the analysis as well. And then third, if they do succeed in being more flexible, more nimble, and more adaptive, the kinds of adaptations that they make can themselves greatly increase uh, conflict risk, and we need to account for that. Uh, in our models, in, in our thinking, and in our policy responses as well. So let me say a bit about each of those three points and then maybe we can open it up to some discussion. Um, financial uncertainty and political uncertainty dominate the agenda of many of the most important actors who are making adaptive decisions in or near uh, international river basins. Uh, let me give you one example. I'm going to take the example of building a large dam, um, but w this example could apply to many, many other of the kinds of adaptive uh, interventions uh, that we might see uh, in an international river basin, in in including things like red plus carbon sequestration or large flood management uh, interventions that try to rework the floodplain and, and, and create uh, more flood resilience or many other things. But ask yourself, what would be the most, the biggest uncertainties um, about whether a dam that we were to build today would be economically profitable 50 years from now? Or we could change that. We could say socially profitable. Will we be pleased as a society that we built that dam 50 years from now? Well, there are many, many, many factors that determine that. What are interest rates going to do? affecting the profitability of the investment. What will be the price of food, the price of water, the price of land? How much political protest and disruption will there be? What will climate change do to the flow uh, in the river? And, and it's very difficult to forecast the outcome of those parameters over a 50-year time horizon. And in fact, so if, if, if it turns out that water is freely available and not scarce, that electricity is very expensive, and that carbon, the price of carbon is very high, we're glad that we're not using fossil fuels, then that's going to be a, a very good uh, dam project. On the other hand, if it turns out that water is the scarce resource 50 years from now, that the renewables revolution has proceeded apace and electricity is cheap, and if we've been more aggressive about uh, sequestering carbon so that the price of carbon is not quite as high as in that other scenario, well, it might be a problematic dam project and we'll regret the fact uh, that we built it. Um, the point is climate change is only one of the parameters in that and from a strictly political and financial point of view it's probably not the biggest parameter. We might wish that it is, we might say it's foolish not to think about it, but the fact of the matter is that's the nature of the decision process. This is the flow regime of the Xingu River, I just happened to choose a Brazilian example, this could be many, many rivers in the world. As we can see historically, the difference in flow between a very dry year and a very wet year is about a factor of two. Well, as we know, there's severe drought in Brazil at the moment and possibly more than a factor of two there. But even if we allowed that to be over the long haul, over the 50 year period, a factor of four, several of these parameters may vary. They may have uncertainty around them that's greater than a factor of four. And so it's very, very difficult um, to uh, adapt to climate change when most of the key decisions in the political economy are adapting to stronger signals that they perceive, whether that's in the financial realm or in the political realm. That's a challenge. Second challenge, existing institutions lack more than just flexibility. They lack more than just adaptive capacity. Frankly, they lack the ability to contain the conversation about what to do in the basin. And I've listed on this slide several examples of where the key decisions that really drive energy use, land use, water use, infrastructure 
in an international river basin are occurring outside of the context of the basin uh, commission and the formal dialogue, the dialogue that may be governed by a treaty in the basin. So power purchasing agreements for hydroelectricity, a good example is the Mekong. The Mekong uh, River, Com the, the MRC, the Mekong River Commission, created by treaty that's having a dialogue about sustainable development and the role of hydropower, chugs along. But while it's dialoguing, Laos and Thailand si sign a power purchasing agreement um, underwritten by the Asian Development Bank and the World Bank that makes Laos one of the world's largest electricity exporters when it completes building a dam on the main stem or on one of the tributaries uh, of the Mekong. And that dynamic is something that the Basin Commission has a very hard time to account for. Financing, basically providing insurance for the risk that private actors take when they invest. That same dam on a, main tri a major tributary of the Mekong in Laos, in the old days, the Asian Development Bank might have written a check to the government of Laos and the government would build the dam using those funds and then pay, pay the loan back. Uh, today, it's going to be a consortium of 25 or 30 private actors investing in that dam and taking a profit from that dam because Laos is selling the power to Thailand. And the role of the multilateral development banks is no longer to finance those projects. It's to make them sufficiently low risk that private actors will actually invest. And so much of the funding that actually goes in from the multilateral development banks is essentially in the form of an insurance policy. And that's a process that sits outside the basin commissions. Land use decisions, you know, what we might think of as land grabs, which often are really water grabs, uh, for agricultural land that's rich with water um, are increasingly driven by corporate supply chain decisions and managing risks around water and moving production around to manage those risks. Again, something that's very, very difficult for the Basin Commission and the treaty regime to internalize uh, into its dialogue. And a final example, and I think a really, really important one, localized, uh, uh, localized uh, conflict um, uh, cities versus farmers. So a very interesting study that uh, Florky and colleagues published in Nature's Sustainability in 2018. They looked at the, I, I, I'm blanking on the number, 482, something like the 500 largest cities in the world, and they looked at uh, agricultural demand in the region around those cities, and then municipal urban demand in the regions uh, around those cities. Uh, there we have it, 482. Uh, projecting out to 2050, looking both at demand projections for water in the municipal sector and in the agricultural sector, and also looking at climate scenarios and how they might affect water availability in uh, the basin. Uh, and they concluded that in one out of five of the largest cities in the world, uh, there will be direct conflict. Uh, meaning incompatibility, not necessarily violence. This wasn't a study about violence. It was a study about water allocation. Uh, incompatibility between farming agricultural demands and uh, urban uh, agricultural demands. Well, th those cities are not parties to the treaties. They're probably not active participants in the Basin Commission. But if you look at the 20 largest cities that they identified, several of them in the southwestern United States, in the Colorado River Basin, or taking water out of the Colorado River Basin, Los Angeles, uh, San Diego, uh, Long Beach, which is near Los Angeles in, 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 in California, um, half of them in the Americas, right? Our attention is drawn to South Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East. Half of these top 20 are in the Americas. The great majority of them are in or near or sometimes straddling a, 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 a transboundary uh, basin. So for all of these kinds of challenges, it's very, very difficult for that to be captured uh, by the uh, by the uh, um, by the legal regime and by the treaty regime itself, and here I want to give out uh, uh, a shout out to uh, Isabella Espindola, who had a very nice article in I don't know maybe she can put it in the chat. I've got it somewhere here in my notes. I think it was in Nature Sustainability 
just in the past year that talks about localized tensions in the La Plata basin, uh, which will be of interest and familiar to Us Brasileiros on the call, and how even though the basin formally, the commission and the treaty regime may seem to function reasonably well, there's all sorts of localized societally based conflicts that really, really complicate the basin management problem and that generate conflict and tensions. So have a look at that article for sure. And then the third point is that even if we can get through those first two challenges, that it's finance and politics that's driving the adaptation agenda, that some of the most powerful actors lack voice in the treaty arrangements. I should also note that some of the most vulnerable actors lack voice in the treaty arrangements. And what, what passes for stakeholder dialogue in most international river basin commissions is not a very robust version of, 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 of dialogue, not a very broadly participatory version uh, of dialogue. Even if we can get through all of that, the actual agenda um, can itself increase conflict risk. So what you're seeing on the screen is just my prediction of broadly speaking how uh, our, our use and governance and management of water is going to change over the next, I don't know, 40, let's say 40 years, the, 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 the lifetime of, uh, of a dam, 40, 50 years. Um, we'll be storing more water and it will be really valuable to be able to do so to smooth out all these unpredictabilities and uncertainties and, and, and people who can't store water suffer at the mercy of the rainfall. Uh, and if that's becoming somewhat unhinged, uh, then storing water becomes even more valuable uh, than it is uh, already. We'll be recycling more water as it becomes a, 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 a more precious commodity um, and get rid of some of the absurdities where uh, we use all of this energy and effort to clean water to a world-class standard and then it gets pumped to my home uh, and I use several liters of it to flush away uh, a few centiliters of urine uh, and then that contaminated water then gets pumped back to a waste treatment system. And this is describing a well-functioning waste management system, the sort that you know, 3 billion people on the planet do not have access to. Uh, and then once that water has been treated, it simply gets dumped back in the river. That sort of an open flow makes absolutely no sense. And we'll be closing uh, a lot of those loops. Um, I'm not going to read through this entire list, but jumping down to the last one, We'll be managing our landscapes and our human settlements with much more attention to flood risk. Well, those are smart adaptations and those are good adaptations, but they're also adaptations that really raise conflict risks. We know that there's enormous conflict tension around storing water. The water that we recycle may well be used downstream by someone else. And so it's essentially an unintentional reallocation of the water and the denial of a livelihood resource to someone downstream because even though that water may be contaminated and we may have damaged it in some way, they still rely upon it as a resource. Um, flood risk, making room for the river, right? Instead of trying to discipline and master rivers, we allow them to flow, we allow them to overtop their banks, we allow them to do what they're naturally inclined to do. Well, who has to move to make room for the river? Uh, what are the impacts on that, uh, on marginal communities, on peri-urban communities, on particularly vulnerable communities? Um, that's a very, very challenging and potentially a very conflict-laden question. So I just highlight those three. Uh, we could probably find conflict risk and a need for conflict sensitivity in all of these, um, but those three are, are per of particular interest to me and I think particularly clear. So if that's all true, and I'll, I'll conclude with this thought, if it's, if it's true that climate change is really only part of the story of managing risk in terms of how actors are actually starting to respond, um, if existing institutions struggle to manage the conversation and to bring the key actors into the conversation, and if the adaptation agenda itself creates risk for conflict, what are the implications of that for policy and practice? How do we need to adapt that three-part recipe I talked about earlier um, around uh, the idea of increasing adaptive capacity, sharing more information, you know, all the things I talked about earlier. 
Well, I, I'm not going to say much about this. I would really welcome people's thoughts on the call in a moment when I stop, but I'll simply throw out a few ideas for you. Um, the risk management case for decentralization needs to be made much more effectively than it has been made. Instead of building that thousand megawatt dam, or, or larger these days, uh, maybe 10 hundred megawatt facilities or a hundred 10 megawatt facilities. Um, while it may not look as, as cost effective or financially profitable, if we know exactly when and where and how to build the dam, the fact is we don't know when and where and exactly how to build the dam and what the price of water, uh, protest, food, electricity, et cetera, interest rates, et cetera, is going to be. Well, here I want to I want to give a sh I want to go back to these uncertainties, and I want to give a shout out uh, to a study that Professor Wagner did uh, ten years ago, published eleven years ago in Water Alternatives on the Belo Monte Dam. And what that study showed is when you take your best guess of what the range of uncertainty around these parameters is, and then you simulate the construction of the dam ten thousand times, allowing these to vary. So you get some winning scenarios, some losing scenarios, but you get a much broader picture. The dam does not make sense from a sort of a social profitability point of view, 73% of those 10,000 uh, scenarios. There's a very, very powerful economic argument for decentralization to take conflict risk pressure off of some of the leading basins in the world. We need to make this sort of argument uh, much more persuasively, uh, much more uh, powerfully. We have the tools, the analytic tools to do it. We need to start doing it. Uh, well, Professor Wagner was doing it 10 years ago, but we need to bring it into mainstream policy discourses much more uh, effectively. I'm not suggesting that would have changed the decision making around the Belo Monchi Dam, but it is one tool I think we need to mobilize. A second key is we need to think when we think about enhancing the capacity of the base of the water management institutions in uh, international basins we need to think not just about the technical skill set that they have we need to think about their ability to think probabilistically in this manner and their ability to, to, to kind of navigate their way along a sequence of branching decisions that keeps future options open, that allows for adaptation, uh, that doesn't, as we like to say in the United States, doesn't put all of our eggs into one single uh, basket. This is a cost-benefit study that was done on, a, on some dam proposals in the Mekong. And I, I don't worry about the figure. I'm not going to try to explain it or interpret it. But essentially, when the official cost-benefit study was done, it was not able to account for the value of the fisheries in the Mekong. And so it concluded that Laos would benefit greatly, Thailand would benefit somewhat, and the other countries would not be much affected by the dam construction. The reason it couldn't account for the value of the fisheries is the fisheries are not monetized. They're small scale, the, the real value is in the small scale artisanal fisheries that feed, I don't know, maybe 20 million people in the Mekong Delta region. But the state doesn't have the capacity to see, to monitor, to assess, and to value uh, those fisheries and therefore it's not going to be able to make wise decisions even if it flips into a mode of making decisions in this more flexible and incremental and tree branching manner. And then the final point that I'll leave you with and, and we can open it to questions and comments is we need to broaden the rights-based agenda around water to think not simply about a human right to water for individuals uh, important though that is, vital though that is, that we keep pushing on that, but to think about the rights of regions, the rights of places and spaces, the rights of rivers themselves. And so I think the, the riverine rights movement that we're starting to see emerge in many places around the world um, is a very, very interesting uh, movement to try to hold decision-making more accountable. And I also think that in the stakeholder dialogues that we have, not everything can be subject to negotiation. Establishing a rights-based floor for how uh, water, environment, 
climate resilience are treated in basins and then allocating water based on that rather than subjecting that to the negotiations because it's often the first thing that gets negotiated away um, or not even considered um, is a critical critical adjustment as well. Um, I have more thoughts on this that I could share with you and I'm sure people on the call have many thoughts as well. So let me stop talking uh, at that point and um, we can uh, we can field uh, the comments and the questions and hopefully I won't have to reconnect to the call again. Luis Paulo, say something so that I can, uh, hello. I can hear you. Can, can you hear me? Can? Can? Can you hear me? Okay, I'm not hearing anything. So unless I get instructions in the chat, I'm going to quickly take a moment to reconnect to the. Um, no, Luis Paulo, I cannot no. hear you. Um, Maybe see, my problem has been every time someone else connects to joins the room live, mm -hmm. it seems to knock out my ability to hear. I think if I just quickly leave the studio and come back, it should be fine, as it was previously. So I'll go ahead and reconnect. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, while can try to connect, maybe Enrique Enrique can come in and made a short, uh, short resume, uh, short abstract of the presentation. Enrique, are you in? Mm. Okay, this is Enrique Castro. This is Enrique Castro. Well, boa tarde, well, Luiz. Boa tarde, uh, todo mundo que está no, nos acompanhando. Obrigado, pro Professor Ken. Eu vou fazer um breve resumo em português sobre o, o que o, a apresentação do professor, para a gente ter um resumo em português, mas é, depois, quando o vídeo ficar no YouTube, a gente vai subir também um, é, uma legenda em português da apresentação inteira. Então, resumindo rapidamente a apresentação do professor Ken, ele falou um pouco sobre é, os conflitos em bacias transfronteiriças, né? e ele examinou alguns fatores de risco que ele julga que são é, subexaminados, principalmente no contexto do, das mudanças climáticas. É, ele comentou, deu uma breve apresentação, que a maioria dos países hoje no mundo divide um corpo de água com outros países, e que isso tem um potencial para gerar bastante conflito. Mas ele falou também que, ao contrário do que se supõe, é, algumas pesquisas apontam que nem, não é só a escassez de água que gera esses conflitos. Inclusive, é, a escassez de água é uma, ele aponta como uma coisa reducionista e que a maioria dos conflitos não acontece por causa disso. A maioria dos conflitos é, em bacias internacionais acontece por outros motivos, como, por exemplo, é, por decisões unilaterais, como a construção de uma represa, ou então de mudanças é, políticas na bacia, por exemplo, na, é, na dissolução de algum, de algum país, algum problema político do tipo, e que, na verdade, a maioria das relações entre países que dividem é, água, elas são cooperativas. É, ele, ele comentou também, o professor Kim comentou também sobre uma, é, a fórmulas que ele fala para que poderiam lidar com esses conflitos, para evi que seria evitar surpresas, então ter um maior, é, maior troca de informações entre as partes envolvidas, uma a maior consulta das duas partes, ter uma, uma administração mais adaptativa a mudanças e incertezas nessas bacias e aumentar a capacidade de diálogo entre as partes também para a resolução de, de, das disputas e de conflitos que possam acabar surgindo. E daí, entrando mais especificamente no, na questão das mudanças climáticas, é, elas são... Não, é, o professor fala que elas são um problema sim, só que elas não são é, um problema especi especificamente por ela, mas mais pela falta de... pela instabilidade, na verdade, que elas geram, né, que a incerteza gera. Ele comentou, por exemplo... É, de atores locais que estão acostumados e sabem é, lidar muito bem com essas mudanças, quando elas começam a ficar incertas, começa a gerar uma dificuldade de adaptação, uma dificuldade de lidar com isso, e isso talvez seja um problema maior é, e um desafio maior na, na, na gestão dessas bacias. É... Por exemplo, o que pode acontecer com eventos extremos, né, de imprevisibilidade, ou então de respostas, é, que ele chama de respostas intrusivas para resolver o problema, 
é, que possa gerar a partir dessas mudanças climáticas. Então, é, as mudanças climáticas seriam apenas uma parte, e para isso, além disso, as instituições tinham que é, falham né, na, na, é, nessa inflexibilidade é, para lidar com isso. E que a agenda de adaptação climática, então, por aumentar os riscos, desse, é, essa imprevisibilidade aumenta também os riscos de conflito, causando incerteza é, financeira, política, que talvez seja a coisa que deveria ser é, levada mais, é, olhada mais a sério. É, daí ele cita bastante, é, alguns exemplos né, sobre isso, e ele é, acaba concluindo que a, a mudança climática então, é parte do problema, é parte importante do problema, mas não é só, ela não, o problema não é reduzido a isso. E que a agenda é, que pensa nisso deveria pensar mais nessa parte adaptativa, é, se adaptar melhor, se preparar melhor para essa imprevisibilidade, para essa incerteza que surge com ela. E pra, na, na conclusão, o professor quem aponta que o que a gente poderia fazer é, por exemplo, ele dá três é, sugestões que seriam uma descentralização para reduzir riscos, por exemplo, em, é, em projetos é, de larga escala, que colocam muita pressão em algumas bacias, é, aumentar a capacidade de adaptação, como, como eu já falei algumas vezes nesse, nessa síntese, e aumentar uma agenda que, que ele fala direitos dos rios, né? Sem ignorar os direitos dos humanos à água, mas também pensar nos direitos dos rios no sentido da importância que eles têm geograficamente para o lugar que eles estão. Então, é, acho que é mais ou menos isso, em linhas gerais, o que o professor Ken comentou na, na apresentação dele. Uh, obrigado, Henrique. Thank you, Henrique, for our for a uh, short presentation about the, the talk. And let's do the, let's go to the Q&A. Just two comments, um, you talk, uh, Professor Ken quoted the uh, Isabella's and Professor Wagner article. It was in Water International uh, about La Plata Basin. And then, uh, Ken, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, yeah, nice. And then we have, uh, uh, First of all, as well, many thanks for your comments and questions in the chat. Uh, we are going to do uh, two sets of three questions. Uh, then I'm going, I'm going to do the first three questions and Professor Ken can answer. Um, let's let's see the first question uh, here. Hmm. Uh, the first question, Professor Ken, it's uh, how can we improve communication and collaboration between climate scientists and political scientists Uh, the second, uh, how people that have less power but depend the most of the waters in a direct way, such as in the uh, gold breeder example, can be more present in the debate instead of powerful actors? Ah, the questions are... Uh, I, I, I think you can see the questions at, at, at the screen. And the third question is... Um, How privatization processes, which we have seen in many countries, can affect international water cooperation? How do you see these new actors from private sector? Um, the floor is yours, Professor. Bom, eu vou tentar responder brevemente em português e depois em inglês. Muito obrigado pelas perguntas. Em termos da privatização, Uh, é fundamental, porque, e, e não é que estes atores não estão considerando risco, perigo, né? Mas é definido principalmente em termos financiais e políticas, não climáticas. Então, se os... Se os efeitos da mudança da clima uh, traduzir em impactos no mercado, eles respondem. Mas em termos dos serviços ecossistêmicos, por exemplo, que não são marketized, não sei como se diz em português, é, é problemático. Né? Uh, briefly, I just on privatization, Uh, I think th I think it's fundamental, and I think the key point is it's not that they are not 
recognizing climate risk or taking actions to manage climate risk, land and water grabs are a form of managing climate risk. Uh, the problem is the signals that they respond to are primarily market-based, financial and political in nature, rather than ecological or climatological in nature. And so for a resource with a well-functioning market, they will respond to the price signal. If we make the case that that dam is a risky investment because it is so inflexible and it would be better to supply energy in a way that you can adapt. You can change your mind in 10 years as you acquire new information. Well, there's a hard financial value to that and market analysts who understand risk and uncertainty very, very well might be movable by that kind of an argument. The problem is for all the things we value that are not marketized and that therefore they're, 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 there's not a single, including the, the critical ecosystem functions, uh, the livelihoods of smallholders uh, and, and, and human rights. And so I think the privatization turn, um, it, in some ways it increases a sensitivity to risk management, but it, it doesn't, um, uh, it, it does so in a very uneven sort of a way where some risks get managed. I published an article a few years back in Water Alternatives called Which Risks Get Managed um, that talks exactly about that point and I would encourage people to take a look at it. On the question about improving dialogue between political scientists uh, and, and, and climate scientists, it's happening, or, or maybe social scientists more generally we could say, and climate scientists, it's happening very slowly. It's very interesting to watch the IPCC, which has been dominated by climate scientists. As the question has turned increasingly toward adaptation, mitigation is still very important, but we've bought into a certain amount of climate change. We're going to, we're going to suffer that. We have seen the IPCC focus more on adaptation, and that's the realm of social science. So in the last IPCC assessment report, there was a chapter on human security. I was actually a reviewer uh, on, on that chapter. Uh, the water chapter started bringing in more of what we know from the social science of water. I was a reviewer on that chapter uh, at, 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 as, as well. Um, the mistakes they made are not my fault, but I was a reviewer. And it's very, very challenging for the natural science paradigm to hear what the social sciences have to say. When it can be quantified, when it can be rendered as the statistical analysis of data, I think that tends to fit the science model. But so much of our deepest knowledge about what basins need is ethnographic. It's culturally based. It's very contingent. It's very place specific. And so even if we understand it in, in, in rigorous terms of modern social science, that's not the only way to understand. It's not the only way to know. And other ways of knowing are very important. But even if we can render it in those terms, it still becomes very, very difficult to plug into some of the natural science models. And so honestly, I think there's a power asymmetry in who controls the dialogue and it's dominated by the natural sciences and that playing field uh, needs to be leveled. We need to be holding our dialogues and inviting natu natural scientists to come and learn and not be in a position to sort of dominate the agenda. They like to plug social science in at the end after um, the real analysis of science has been done, maybe to tally costs, maybe to identify policy options, uh, but not to really understand politics, culture, and human behavior as factors in what is not an ecological system. It's an, a socio-ecological uh, system. So I think it's a really key question um, and I, I, I don't think it happens just by us showing up at those events. I think it's a question of power over the agenda. I'm sorry, I missed the third question. It was the one that was in the middle. Can you just briefly remind me what it was? Yeah. Uh, no, what's about privatization? Yeah, I think... Uh, so there was about, the question about privatization. There was the yes. question about the dialogue uh, between uh, natural and social standpoint. sciences. Yeah. Uh, the people then, that have less power but depends on the most of, of the waters in a direct way. Uh, uh, about that quoted your example about gold breeders um, uh, can be more present in the debate instead of powerful actors. Uh, uh, bon. 
Do meu ver, esta pergunta tem toda a ver com direitos humanos. Uh, é verdade que comunidades locais, pessoas locais, têm entendimento fundamental, entendimento necessário. E a máquina política, a máquina científica está começando de entender este fato. E está começando de convidar estes vozes ao diálogo. Mas não basta, porque é somente uma consideração instrumental. Então, tem muitos problemas com a ideia de direitos humanos individualizado, liberalizado, não é justiça, faz um mínimo. Uh, mas, it's a tool. Como se diz tool em português? Esqueço. <laughs> Ferramenta. É, claro. Uh, ok, so back to English now. Um, the question was about how to bring the voices of local communities, vulnerable communities, uh, more directly into the dialogue. And that is where I think the rights connection is so fundamental. And I said that there are lots of problems with human rights uh, in terms of off, you know, being individualized, when often what we would like to recognize as a right is not the individual, it's the community. It's the spatial area. It's maybe the river itself. So the human rights dialogue is not perfect. It's also not perfect because often it establishes just a minimum floor, just barely enough water, just barely breathable air, etc. Um, that said, the point I was trying to make at the end, I think, is really the key point about you have to establish what that floor is and make that floor non-negotiable. You know, there will always be dialogue, there will be always give and take, there will be always be negotiations, but I think you have to place that dialogue inside a box of rights and risk. If you are at risk, then you have rights, and you have rights to voice, among other, among, among other things. Um, the Aarhus Convention that the Europeans negotiated, and then has now been emulated uh, in, in, in the Americas, negotiated in Escazú in Costa Rica recently, and that several countries um, have, are, have signed on to or are in the process of signing on to uh, and ratifying, that says that people have a right to information, people have a right to voice, people have a right to uh, redress uh, when, 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 when they're affected. It seems to me that those channels, um, in the legal sense, but also in the political sense, are absolutely critical. Thanks, Professor Ken. Um, let me just uh, make a uh, comment that uh, the video is going to be available in the YouTube for later audience. And we are going to insert a subtitle, a Portuguese subtitle, in order to, if you miss some points or some arguments, you can, you can see it for, uh, afterwards. Um, I'm going to, to do the next three questions. Um, um, what elements? Should we consider for the prospection of a governance mechanism for aquifers containing to the watershed area, given the climate change scenario? I think this question was about uh, from Maria Luisa. She works with uh, aquifers, yes, uh, transboundary aquifers. Uh, the, the fifth question is: What elements should we consider? Oh no, uh, 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 no, I'm repeating. Uh, uh, which uh, I think. Uh, we, we have just one more question. Um, uh, the next question then is, uh, what a governance is bound to governance needed for all other natural resources necessary for rich SDGs and climate agreements? What strate strategies are being implemented to achieve the best results? Um, uh, yeah, I think there are... Okay. Uh, May I then uh, have the space Tudo for bem. one more question? I, I can I make one of my own. Uh, well, hold that yeah. one. Let me answer these two, and then you make uh, your yeah. question. Because <laughs> okay. it's too many to remember, and I'm taking okay. notes. So. It's enough. Well, um, 
uh, Maria Luisa was correct to ask me about aquifers and what she's really saying is Ken you didn't say anything about aquifers your talk was entirely about surface water um, and, and, and that is correct uh, and at one level and, and there's a few reasons for that one is I know less about groundwater two we know less about groundwater uh, we have much the, the data is not nearly as good um and it, it, it it's there's a there's a larger veil of of uncertainty um and so i tend to gravitate this is a mistake probably but i tend to gravitate toward the examples where the data is better and i'm more comfortable in my own um understanding on one level the problem around aquifers is is different um and, and people in this field will often talk about a sort of a river and a lake right and a river creates upstream downstream dynamics and it creates these sorts of asymmetries unless you happen to live on opposite banks of the river in which case you should probably think of it more like a lake because you both put into it and you both take out of it in a more maybe in a more balanced and equitable and symmetrical fashion and the and the general understanding is that surface waters which are often river like in their upstream downstream dynamics are problematic because of those asymmetries I agree with that, and we often see states upstream doing, I mean, you look at what the United States does in the Colorado River, and then Mexico suffers the consequences. On the other hand, those asymmetries also create opportunities for negotiating, for bargaining, for trading. You know, I might be upstream of you on water quality, but you're upstream of me on air quality, and maybe we can strike a more robust deal. And so if you're looking for cooperative opportunities, which is a key piece of peace building, then sometimes those asymmetries have value and aquifers become more difficult because they don't have those kinds of asymmetries. Um, anyone can stick a straw down into the aquifer and suck out all of the water and so it's more like a lake. It's an underground lake where everyone surrounds the lake. Everyone has an interest in sustaining the lake um, but everyone also maybe has an interest in cheating and grabbing their share before the other can grab their share. I'm not a big believer in Garrett Hardin and the tragedy of the commons. I think that's a really problematic framework. Um, but there's one, there is sort of one insight in that, the kind of destructive competitive dynamic that it can, that it can sort of set up. So there's important differences between aquifers and surface waters that we want to keep in mind. And, and while many of them you know, many of them relate to this question of asymmetries and whether they're present or not. However, right, for most of the themes that I stressed, the um, other considerations in managing risk, the absence of key voices from the room, the absence of marginalized voices from the room, I think it's, it's quite similar. And what's interesting about aquifers is we are just starting to see the international law of underground water start to roll out. We've got a few agreements that are really influential in driving leadership and, 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 and so on. And so I think it's an opportunity to build in some of those principles that I was talking out about in a way that international water law, which is already sort of baked, um, struggles to incorporate. So it's a great question. I think we can think very creatively about aquifers in that, in that regard. On the sustainable development goals, it's interesting. If you look at the Millennium Development Goals on water, very limited. Cut in half the proportion of the world's people that don't have safe drinking water. Cut in half the proportion of the world's people that don't have access to basic sanitation, some, some improved form of sanitation, which is going to be a waterborne system, therefore, of sanitation. The Sustainable Development Goals, on one level, are much broader and much more comprehensive than the Millennium Development Goals. So when you look at the Sustainable Development Goals, eliminate water po poverty, improve uh, sanitation uh, and hygiene, protect the ecosystems on which um, ultimately water quality and sanitation and other water surfaces depend, and make them global universal goals, not simply applying to the Global South or less developed countries or the periphery, whatever, whatever your preferred term is for that sort of global geopolitics. Um, so much improvement there in the, in the Sustainable Development Goals. Problem with the Sustainable Development Goals 
in my view, is that they're not rights-based. And I think this was a loss. This was a missed opportunity. Uh, at the same time that the United Nations is finally discovering that there is a human right to water, there's no rights-based language in the Sustainable Development Goals. And so again, it becomes a conversation primarily about national quantified targets, strategies of investment, best practices for attainment, all of which is important, and not starting from a rights-based commitment. One of the things we saw in the Millennium Development Goals was that many countries, to achieve the national target, would invest in somewhat less needy neighborhoods where they would have a higher success rate and therefore they could drive the numbers forward. And so there are documented examples in the MDGs of them being sort of socially regressive and redistributive, you know, not sort of justice oriented and not helping those most in need. And there's a real danger without those rights-based commitments that everybody has a right to this. Um, that something similar happens over time with the investment patterns that we see in the SDGs. That battle was lost when the SDGs were defined and codified and rolled out. But that battle is still going on at the level of SDG implementation and the metrics that we use for success. And it's a very important one. So I, I really appreciate the question. Luis Paulo. Thank you. Pergunta. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Um, I just want to ask about our, your thoughts about the whole of the, of the state in developing a more adaptive and, and effectively more adaptive and decentralized uh, governance. It might seem contradictory to think about state as adaptive and decentralized, but uh, the state does have much uh, authority and maybe power to act uh, along the territories, at least the shared territories. And maybe what, what are your thoughts about the whole of the state to develop this kind of new paradigm about water and risk management? Sure. And, and to me, it, 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 it's, it's a great question. It's the question in some ways. And to me, it's a matter of capability plus accountability. And so if we decentralize, maybe we enhance certain forms of accountability, we allow more voices into the conversation, we get solutions that are closer to localized needs. Decentralization often is not a move for democratization in practice, often quite the opposite. Um, but it can be. And we keep coming back to it because of the idea of subsidiarity, the idea that you, it's, a decision is best taken, you know, when it's closest. But then there's also the question of capability. And we keep coming back to the temptation of the state because we have the idea that only national governments or even coalitions of natural governments can command the political power and the economic resources and so on to actually make the changes uh, that are necessary. And so we want both... The, the capability and the accountability, and, and, and we don't want to uh, accept that trade-off. Um, and I don't, in fact, uh, it, 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 it accept that trade-off, because when you look at the way that that allegedly powerful, capable national state behaves, um, you see a couple of patterns. One is a pattern of incoherence, and the other is a pattern uh, that looks a lot like James Scott and his classic work of seeing like a state. If people haven't read that book, I really encourage them to take a look. That suggests that the state is not a politically neutral actor. It's an actor with a sort of a historical project to discipline and to codify and to taxonomize and to render people visible for control and for governance, even if they're not particularly interested in being controlled uh, and, and, and being governed. In the United States, um, there are so many federal agencies that have some form of responsibility around water that again and again and again, whether it's in domestic policy or whether it's in forest policy, we really, really struggle with the dialogue 
Never mind bringing in of stakeholders, people outside of governance and so on, communities, those cities I was talking about, just among the ministries. It's, it's a mess and it's really, really challenging. And so that, that coherent, that state that we think of as coherent in practice actually isn't. The other problem that we face is the problem of where the state is in fact coherent. And here I'll use the example of Brazil and, and I, with apologies, and there are many people on the call that understand Brazil far better than me. But when I look at the process of building dams in Brazil, I see many large structures that the private sector considers far too risky. And so again, it comes back to that point that I was saying about making them profitable, underwriting and minimizing the risk so that people with capital will then invest in these projects. Now, in most of the world, poor countries rely upon the World Bank to provide that insurance so that the private actors will come to the table. Brazil is one of a handful of countries like Russia, like China, like India, sometimes like the United States, that where the state can actually play that risk underwriting uh, sort of role. And so, um, you know, there are decisions that need to be taken at a higher level. Often the law, maybe the establishment of that right that I was talking about, that set of human rights that I was talking about, where the broad power of the state is absolutely critical and we have to steer it in the right direction. But for a lot of the decisions and the judgments, too often what we see in that state is I either an incoherent dialogue or, you know, not the invisible hand, but the visible fist of, of altering markets to make activities profitable. I don't have a magical solution for that problem, but that's the way I frame it and that's the way I think about it. Many thanks, Professor Ken Conca, and obrigado for your talk and for uh, and the chat with the audience at the YouTube. Um, one more time, uh, the, the video is going to be available on your YouTube channel. And you can see afterwards. Um, and let me just, uh, we have this uh, webinar series about uh, transmodular waters around the globe. And first of all, thank you uh, one more time, Professor Ken. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed th this moment. I and may I, just, may I just say, if anyone has questions or would like to be in dial about, about this, or in English or in Portuguese, Mando correo eletrônico e podemos ficar em contato. I had my email address on the screen earlier. It's easy to find it. Just Google me. Um, please, if you have a question uh, or if you have, just have thoughts and opinions, um, I'd love to hear them and, and feel free to send me an email and I'd, I'd enjoy being in contact with people in that way. Uh, thank, thank you so you. much. I, I really yeah. appreciate the opportunity uh -huh. to share my ideas with you today. <laughs> and... Um... Uh, let me say that our, uh, let me see the, the date of our next presentation is going to be with Professor uh, Gonzalo Hachicuri from University of, uh, Universidad Nacional Autónoma do México, from Mexico, um, August 20, uh, 25, about U.S.-Mexico transboundary groundwater. We're going to talk about specifically about groundwater in the next, uh, the next presentation. So the title of the presentation is U.S. Mexico Transboundary Groundwater Conceptual Definitions and Future Strategic Action Programs. Uh, so I, 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 I invite everyone to join uh, to join us on August 25. Um, uh, let me talk in Portuguese. Uh, nossa, última, nossa próxima apresentação vai ser com o professor Gonçalo Hatchcuri da Universidade Nacional Autônoma do México dia 25 de agosto, sobre a fronteira entre os Estados Unidos e o México, especificamente sobre águas transfronteiriças, nesse mesmo canal do YouTube. Uh, one more time, and now to uh, say goodbye to everyone. Many thanks, Professor Ken, many thanks for everyone who uh, watch it and make questions. Uh, see you, and we are here as well. Follow us on our, on our social media, and then we can Keep chatting. Professor Ken. Thank you so much. Thank you to the technical team and to Luis Paulo in particular, uh, Professor Wagner, for organizing this series. I will be in the audience for future events. 
Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>